Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a special event, the inaugural lecture associated with a new prize, the New Statesman Sperry Prize for Political Economy. Uh, my name is Tony Payne, and I'm a professor of political economy at the University of Sheffield and one of the directors of SPERI, uh, which stands for the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute. And it's my very pleasurable task to begin the evening and to say a few words about this new prize before handing over to Faisal Islam, who will introduce the prize winner to you. The prize we're awarding tonight is a prize for political economy. So I want to be very clear what we mean by political economy. And the simple answer to that question is that we're referring to the very close interaction of economic and political processes in society that was instinctively and automatically the focus of attention of a whole range of distinguished founding social scientists as diverse in their approaches and methods as Adam Smith, Karl Marx, Max Weber. In a nutshell, it, what, it was what was universally thought to be important to study before economics and politics broke away from political economy to become specialist and some would say increasingly narrow disciplines in their own right. So the very concept of political economy inevitably contains within it something of a critique of some modern economics and some modern political science. And yet oddly, it's political economy that's still rather on the defensive, such as being the disciplinary power of these two subjects, economics I think rather more than political science, that being or saying you're a political economist today, despite the long history I've mentioned and, and, and amidst the existence of a crisis, being a political economist sometimes feels like riding up the down escalator. And it was very much that sense that political economy needed to be celebrated rather more that led Sperry, the, the institute in Sheffield that I uh, jointly direct, to think up the idea of establishing a new prize in the field for political economy. I suppose we might have called it not the Nobel Prize in economics, uh, but we didn't. Instead, I'm delighted to say that we developed a very close and warm uh, collaboration with the New Statesman magazine, itself more than 100 years old, to create the New Statesman Sperry Prize for political economy, and I'm deeply grateful to Helen Lewis, the deputy editor of the New Statesman, uh, for all of her initial enthusiasm and subsequent active support in this collaboration. We decided that the prize would be awarded biennially to, and I'm going to quote this next bit, the scholar who had succeeded most effectively in disseminating original and critical ideas in political economy to a wider public audience in the preceding two or three years. That was our formal statement. It emphasized originality and critical capacity, of course, but also, and for us, just as importantly, the ability to disseminate and spread the word of what was being argued beyond the academy. We assembled a jury, two people from Sperry, two from the new Statesman, uh, supported by uh, Ms. Zara Connor, economics correspondent of the Financial Times as a kind of representative of the media, uh, and Dr. Gavin Kelly, chief executive of the Resolution Foundation as a kind of representative of the think tank world. We gathered and deliberated and published a short list of six names, all of whom we thought were very distinguished political economists and all of whom could actually have been deserved prize winners. In fact, we didn't realize quite what a difficult job we had given ourselves to do in choosing one of the six, which perhaps makes it all the more remarkable that we were, in the end, unanimous as a jury in choosing the prize winner that we did. So it's a special evening for that person, and I'm now going to turn to Faisal Islam, who's uh, transmuted from being economics editor of Channel 4 News to 
political editor of Sky News to introduce this evening's prize winner. Faisal. Thanks for that. Yeah, that, that job change, I hope, makes, it, uh, makes me lucky enough to be able to have a modern contemporary perspective on political economy, having covered economics uh, for 10 years and now uh, dabbling in the dark arts of politics. Not personally, commentating on it. Um, in my previous job as economics editor, I was, I have to just paint this picture, uh, this amazing picture, a, a key multilateral kind of research event with um, uh, research and development ministers from all around the world and uh, journalists and academics and in the centre, Mariana and people just trying to tap into her brain and her ideas. And the really impressive thing about the pamphlet, which I'm sure you all know about, and which was then turned into a book, The Entrepreneurial State, is just how practical it is and how few public policy practitioners bothered to think or check these things beforehand before Mariana came up uh, with her, her, th her thesis on uh, the role of the state and the changing role of the state in a modern economy. Coming from economics into politics, I kind of note this culture war in British, in British politics uh, from the 80s, this culture war where, you know, it's either you're all in on the role of the, on the, role of the state or you kind of think the free market has to pursue uh, uh, wealth and uh, wealth creation for the whole uh, of the country, and that's the best idea, this cultural war between the kind of Adam Smith Institute and unions. Clearly the world works in a much more mixed economy, and uh, Mariana's book and lectures and TED Talks speak to that and communicate that slightly complicated issue in the most fantastic way. So without further ado, I mean, you, you know, she's a professor of economics, uh, of the economics of innovation at SPRU, the science policy research unit at the University of Sussex. Um, and without further ado, please welcome Mariana Mazzucatu for her prize winning speech. so much. Uh, this is a real honor, especially given that it's the first year of this prize. Um, it's going to happen every two years, is that right? Or every year. Um, and it's also an honor because the other shortlisted um, economists were absolutely fantastic. Not only Piketty, people started calling this the, the prize to beat Piketty. Um, and I will actually be talking about Piketty because I will be talking about inequality, but also I must say that, again, it was a real honor to be shortlisted amongst these other uh, greats, uh, including Ha Jun Chang, who um, I work with uh, indirectly quite closely in terms of uh, how close our ideas are. Um, so what I actually want to do before I, well, first to turn on my timer here, is to focus on the need, are my slides, oh, here we go, on the need to actually talk about in, um, inequality and all the issues around it, and especially the critiques that many people have made recently after the financial crisis in terms of uh, you know, parasitic capital versus productive capital, too much value extraction, not enough value creation, to actually posit that critique, which is so widespread today amongst policymakers and different types of economists, within an actual theory of production. Okay, because otherwise I think it remains sort of uh, icing on the cake and what I'm seeing today and I think lots of us see is things are actually getting worse. You know, some of the hedge funds uh, have made huge amounts of money from, for example, the Greek debt uh, crisis and our inability, I think, to actually really reform the financial system, but also the production system, the distribution system has been, I think, linked to the fact that we have not linked these critiques to an understanding of how actually markets work. Um, so we can't just talk about markets going wrong without first talking about how markets work within a broader theory than what I'll be talking about in terms of the market failure paradigm within neoclassical economics. But also, again, we cannot just make critiques around value extraction and all these things that have gone wrong without really positioning it within a theory of value creation. Um, and so, first of all, the context, right? We are in the UK, um, where uh, this is Andy Haldane's graph here, which just shows how much financial intermediation as a percentage of gross value added has completely outpaced the real economy, right? So this is the context within which, again, policymakers, the media, um, civic society talks about the absolute need to rebalance away from kind of the speculative finance towards the real economy. And in fact, industrial policy, which is something that I've been 
talking about along with my colleagues for years is actually no longer a four-letter word. We can talk about it and it's seen to be the way to partly, if you want, nurture again this growth of the real economy. So first I just want to say something which I will get back to towards the end of the talk, but it's so important that I think one should say it in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end so we don't forget. This way of positioning the need to talk about production and the real economy and industrial policy and innovation is problematic. Why? Because really one of the big problems has not just been finance versus industry um, and the need for you know, higher quality jobs and long run investments, but the degree to which the real economy, industry, has become incredibly financialized. Okay, so I, I'm going to be bringing that up throughout the talk, but this is very important because I think given that I am a uh, uh, professor of the economics of innovation, one of the weaknesses I think today of innovation policy is in fact that it's not linked up with an understanding of say the kind of changes with, we need around corporate governance, uh, so how businesses actually behave, whether it's better for them to be organized in terms of shareholder versus stakeholder type of capitalism, if you want, but also the absolute need to be thinking not just that firms require finance, but what kind of finance they require, and also what kind of, if you want, guidelines should be uh, helping firms to really make these kind of long-run investments rather than just boosting their short-term uh, stock prices. But this battle around rebalancing away from finance towards industry, this you know, need for innovation policy and industrial policy, which is finally again back on the agenda, is just one of the big battles. I think one of the really interesting things around the world, definitely if you just read what's you know, written on top of the sort of big uh, outdoor, uh, build, sorry, the sign out, outside of the OECD, but also within the European Commission, within the UN, but also many different nations are talking about the need, not just for any kind of growth, right, because lots of countries are starving right now for growth, but growth that is, again, innovation-led, I sort of already alluded to that, so smart innovation-led growth, but also growth that is more inclusive, so less, not more inequality. We have been experiencing rapid increases in inequality, and also growth that's more sustainable, which doesn't only mean green, but green is a good sort of a, a one-word summary of what that means. And what I've been sort of talking about really in my work, which I really want to position as not just about innovation, is the complete change that we need in, in, in terms of actually thinking about the role of policy in the state in the process of economic growth. And in fact, the biggest battle is precisely that. Okay, what exactly does the state do? Or, and by the way, I should say this because this is the first critique many people make and I'm sure it would be the first question. I am not talking, when I talk about the state, kind of big brother ministry top down, right? I'm gonna be talking throughout the talk about a decentralized kind of network of different types of public sector institutions that have been absolutely important for generating a certain type of growth, and again, also today needing to think about those institutions, how to shape them. But I would include there, in the UK, just to be clear, agencies like the BBC, okay? So I'm actually talking about publicly funded agencies, institutions, and departments, okay? And so what I'm saying here is that actually within economics, one of the real battles that we have, or the battle that I face as an economist thinking about the role, if you want, of public policy, is that we actually don't have words to really talk about the role of the state. Um, I've just put here these two quotes by Keynes. The first one is really important because what he says that the role of government, of policy, the state, of the public sector should really be big, right? Big thinking. We're not talking about just tinkering on the edges, doing things a little bit better or a little bit worse, but really doing what's not being done at all. So in fact, one of the ways you can think about this blind spot that I'm talking about is that the way that economists talk about what's not being done at all is really limited. And what I'm trying to do is sort of broaden that out. He also says something really important for, again, maybe another critique that might come, especially from some of my interdisciplinary colleagues at SPRU is, you know, well, why are you just talking about the problems of economists, right? I mean, just let them go and talk about the real world. Well, no, the problem is, Unfortunately, as Keynes tells us here, so many people who think they're just being guided by sort of practical thinking and they're not wed to some sort of economic theory, unfortunately, are often the slaves of some sort of defunct economic theory or theorists. And in fact, what I'm gonna be focusing on since we can't talk about the entire economy and all of economists is specifically this defunct 
uh, way, and in fact, I should go back to that quote because it has something great at the end where he says, I'm sure that the power of vested interests is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. In other words, this constant talk about government somehow being captured by business is nothing compared to how much government and policymakers are captured by this kind of you know, encroachment of ideas of these defunct economists. And I'm going to be focusing again specifically on the way that economists think about the role of the state in the process of economic growth. And just to put it kind of quickly, because we don't have that much time, uh, there's you know, the sort of two broad ways that people talk about this is either the need just to fix the public good problem, right? So specifically within, say, the area of innovation, you might have, say, you know, basic research. It's a public good because it's so hard for firms to appropriate returns from uh, basic research privately because of the huge spillovers. And hence, you know, more or less everyone agrees that that's an obvious case for, uh, you know, government intervention. Of course, other types of pu uh, public goods like infrastructure, education, uh, water, clean air, uh, those would all be examples of, you know, the need for public intervention. And this is not to say that that's not important. There's also all sorts of other areas that would uh, be justified through this market failure framework. What I'm going to be sort of arguing is that is that that's quite limited, actually. What governments have done in those few places in the world where uh, 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 countries or regions within countries have achieved this kind of smart innovation-led growth, that only kind of describes 20% or so of what's happened. Of course, the other kind of more general framework and way that we talk about the role of the state, again, thinking of places like the European Commission, uh, which I, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm often at to advise uh, policymakers um, is in terms of these framework conditions, right? The need for different types of public policy to create these kind of background conditions, um, framework conditions for then the private sector to do uh, its thing. Now, my main critique is really kind of building on the work of Carl Polanyi, who's, who some others have also, I think, found great inspiration. And Carl Polanyi was not an economist. This is quite important to say. He was a historian slash kind of sociologist. And his big point was really to understand the way that markets and the distinction between markets and the state is actually false from the start. I mean, I'm today going to be talking a lot about the innovation economy, because we talk a lot about that in modern capitalism. But he really positioned this from the start, from the beginning of capitalism, which, by the way, is quite recent. It, it hasn't been around for thousands and thousands of years, right? This is the big debate also between Marx and Engels. Uh, how old was capitalism? Um, so from the beginning of capitalism, about 300 years ago, the market actually emerged almost via, actually, via state intervention. Um, and it was quite interesting because he compared it to local and international markets. He argued that local markets, kind of like fruit stands where you, you know, buy fruit or vegetable in the corner, uh, which we still have today, or international markets, were actually, you know, actually are quite old. And they almost seem natural in the sense that they are so old that you could almost say they're in the DNA of uh, the human race to, you know, go and sell and barter, perhaps in a corner. corner. He didn't actually say that. But the point is these local and international markets are very old, whereas the national market, which is the specifically capitalist market, was deeply shaped and created by constant state intervention. We would not have had, we wouldn't have today the kind of markets that we talk about had it not been for different types of political and legal changes. Um, he says it here, um, administrators had to be constantly constantly on the watch to ensure the free working of the system, the so-called free market. It was in no way natural. It had to be imposed through all sorts of different uh, 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 um, legal and political uh, changes. So different, you know, the, well, obviously prop, you know, uh, private property, uh, the notion of public goods, the different uh, um, regulations, which of course are behind the enclosure laws, child labor legislation, infrastructure, R&D funding, introduction of different types of tariffs. This is the kind of thing that, for example, Ha Jun Chang has written about so eloquently, one of the other people shortlisted for this prize. What I try to do in this book, and sorry, this is the quite self-promoting slide. There, there won't be another one, but again, this is probably the, the night to do it. Um, uh, is, is to really think about that insight that Polanyi had about the falsity, the absolute falsity historically of state versus market 
in the modern context of the sort of innovation, knowledge, information society. Because nowhere more than today, in fact, was that initial insight he had just so true. And what's interesting is that even though different people, especially in my area in innovation uh, economics, have critiqued sometimes this market failure framework for justifying certain things, we haven't actually built um, within, I, I would argue within economic or heterodox economic theory, a real alternative to that market failure framework. So even when we come up with these great progressive policies, they often also get evaluated through different types of indicators which actually derive from that framework. So what I try to do in this book, and I just have to say that the German title is obviously the best one, you know, Das Kapital, this, that, and it was quite nice that Piketty and I uh, were up against each other also for a German prize, and it was his, you know, Das Kapital in the 21st century, and my Das Kapital, this, that, and it kind of looked like everyone was writing Das Kapital for a minute there, which unfortunately isn't true. Uh, and I should also say that the German publisher, I don't know if they would want me to say this so explicitly, but on the phone when we were talking about what the German translation should be, she said, you know, Mariana, the problem is that for most of the German left, the word entrepreneurial state in German is kind of going to make them vomit. I was like, oh, that, that's great, thanks. And so then she said, you know, she had this great idea for the book uh, title. I was like, yes, well, why not? In Italy, it was quite interesting, the title, The Innovative State, because in Italian, and I'm not sure if other Italians would agree with me, but the word imprenditore or imprenditoriale doesn't do, for me at least, what entrepreneurial does, because what entrepreneurial means to me is obviously not just setting up a company um, or running a business, it's really the willingness and the ability to really think and envision the, the spaces that have the highest risk and uncertainty. So to sort of op be operating in that upper right-hand quadrant and just think of it in different sectors or different even regions of the world, depending on what the state of development is, um, those areas that are subject to the highest capital intensity and the highest technological and market risk. Um, and specifically, what I tried to do was completely debunk this idea, coming back to those uh, you know, ways to think about the role of the state, that somehow all the state was doing um, in the in innovation economy and the information economy was just creating these kind of background conditions and doing you know, the necessary paperwork, getting the right tax and legal system, getting the right also infrastructure, research, and good schools, but then letting the really interesting dynamic stuff be done in the private sector because this kind of lame approach, which then specifically leads us to use words like de-risking, right? The role of the public sector is somehow just de-risking. The private sector ignores the fact that in fact in so many different examples, at least the ones that I talk about in the book, but also that, um, for example, Caetano Penna and I, who, who's here, he's a research fellow working with me, we're looking at around the world, like in China, Denmark, Germany, or Brazil today, really seeing this kind of entrepreneurial role of different types of state institutions which have been willing to really think about different missions, different visions, actually creating actively different markets, not just fixing different problems within them. Because that view really brings you again, and, I'll, and hopefully we'll, maybe we'll come to some of this in the question and answer period, to a completely different view of the role of public policy. We do not need government to simply sort of assume the existence of Keynesian animal spirits wanting to invest and perhaps being guided, yes, wrongly by herd effects or bandwagon effects. You know, Keynes has very important insights that what's actually driving investment behavior is actually kind of this gut instincts of where those future opportunities are, but actually creating those opportunities, right? So we don't have a lion in a cage business wanting to invest, and again, perhaps also doing it wrongly because of these bandwagon effects, um, and then needing uh, the state to enter to sort of just take away different types of impediments, which unfortunately today in innovation policy is one of the big sort of mantras of how we think about it. So R&D tax credits, or in this country, the patent box, or just kind of facilitating the process, but actually the need to create that instinct, that animal instinct to want to uh, invest, to actually create those opportunities, which only then business follows. Um, some water. Uh, and, and when I talk about innovation and technology, I'm not talking about sort of gadgets and changes from the iPhone 4 to the iPhone 5, but these really kind of big technological changes that have occurred, which have created kind of decades of growth, and in thinking about them, I thought that was already the sign saying five minutes, but it's just his iPad, thank God. Uh, <laughs> um, 
really thinking about the way that uh, market failure policies, which again completely guide how economics thinks about the role of the state, can basically not explain at all the emergence of any of these really relevant technologies, which again created decades of, of growth. And the big question, of course, today is what's going to be the next big uh, general purpose technology, and of course, what kind of sort of visions and missions might drive uh, the public sector to actually make those kind of investments. So let me just go back to this. I wish this was going to be closer to me. Anyway, um, I'll keep drinking. Mm. What do I mean by mission driven? I mean that in thinking about those different uh, general purpose technologies, what you had was two things. First, that they were again driven by some sort of mission, you know, not necessarily good or bad. This is not a normative point, right? This is just kind of a fact. So getting a man or a woman on the moon was one of those missions. Fighting climate change today is another one guiding lots of investments, for example, in China, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and what's interesting is both the, the, the fact that that kind of vision was created, the fact that it required lots of different sectors to interact, right, kind of 13 to 14 different sectors had to actually been, you know, be catalyzed if you want to get a man on the moon. This was not a sort of standard industrial policy in saying, oh, we just need aerospace and, and some sort of other manufacturing sector. Lots of different industries, including textiles, made that happen. Um, but also that these investments were in fact along the entire innovation chain. So that this again classic justification for the role of the state in areas like public goods, like basic research, would kind of justify the really upstream uh, investments around basic research, what you actually have had in places like Silicon Valley, and you have today in places like China, parts of China, are in fact investments along that entire chain. So you probably can't see this, I don't know if you have smaller uh, uh, graphs near you there, but the, in the orange are different types of public sector institutions which were critical to that process from the National Science Foundation, DARPA. So the, the National Science Foundation, which founded, by the way, Google's algorithm, DARPA, which was one of the lead funders of the internet, the SBIR program, which in the UK we've sort of copied, not very creatively, using the same letters, SBRI, uh, which pr provides basically early stage seed financing for uh, companies. ARPA-E in the Department of Energy, which is trying to do for renewable energy what DARPA did for the internet in terms of really funding a lot of applied downstream research. And if you read the websites of these agencies, again, public sector agencies like the BBC, um, again, I'm, I'm repeating the BBC for a purpose, which again, hopefully we can come back to later. Um, are very mission driven. If you read you know, ARPA-E's website, it's definitely the mission to think about in a creative way, different ways to uh, catalyze innovation around renewable energy investments. Um, by the way, if you think of it in the German case, those green investments that they're making, I think, is also very explicitly mission oriented because they have this mission around the energy vend strategy, which is completely trying to transform and greenify green um, all sectors, not just kind of wind, solar, and biofuels. And Carlotta Perez, who's in the audience, has been one of the leading people around the world, I think, really giving us a way to think about that because green is not really a revolution if you think about it, right? Lots of these technologies have been around for a while. IT was a revolution and it has absolutely not been fully deployed throughout the whole economy yet and green could become a new direction uh, through which the IT revolution does become fully deployed. Um, in the same way she argues that for example suburbanization was absolutely important and all the policies around it to allow mass production, that revolution, to really diffuse and get fully deployed. So so green as a redirection of IT, as suburbanization was kind of a redirection of, again, mass production. I should, I should again repeat, none of this means good or bad. I obviously am someone who, or shouldn't say obviously, I am someone who thinks green and thinking about green is absolutely fundamental, but that example I just gave of suburbanization, you might have people saying, well, that was a, you know, the wrong choice, or uh, going to the moon, well, how silly was that? We should have used all our money for something else. So the point is not to say good, bad, it's to say that actually these state investments have huge transformative market making, market creating potential and hence the immense need that there should be or that there is to actually make sure that we talk about this directionality as opposed to thinking that all you need is kind of these background based kind of boring things that the state does and then the market will decide the direction. Markets are actually quite blind and what we see in these transformative periods in history is that the direction itself 
uh, was actually, uh, if you want, almost imposed in a, in a, a decentralized way, because these are you know, different types of public sector institutions uh, by government. And so we shouldn't be so worried about should we pick or not pick winners, we should have a much more open and dynamic debate of you know, how to do that picking, how to make sure that, for example, we are actually able to attract into government uh, top thinkers and experts like, for example, the man, a Chinese American man who was recently running the Department of Energy in the US, Steve Chu, who was a Nobel Prize winner in physics. And, you know, how cool is that? The problem, I would argue, that by having this really narrow, boring, lame way to talk about the role of the state at best, at best, because we all know that lots of people say, just get the hell out of the way, we don't need state investments, at best as market fixing, becomes this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're a top graduate from any um, university, do you just want to be a fixer, a tweaker, doing little things here and there, or would you find it much more interesting to go work in a place like Google, uh, where you're actually told that you are you know, the, the person who's kind of shaking and making the world? And this is what's, I think, absolutely central, not just saying we need more money or we need all these great institutions. We absolutely have to make sure that we are attracting into these institutions people of top expertise who can actually uh, think big. Um, let me just run through some of the data quickly. I mean, this is quite important. I think this SBIR funding that I mentioned, because again, if you just think of it as, as basic research, it kind of just becomes something that everyone knows is important. What's interesting is precisely because the financial sector, coming back to that graph I showed before, has become so short-termist and speculative, the need for this kind of public funding of the actual companies that want to be innovating, so early stage seed finance to companies, has become increasingly important to come from different types of public funds. Why? If you talk to any venture capitalist, you know they're obsessed with an exit, which they want to happen in three to five maximum years, mainly through an IPO or a buyout, and that's not necessarily the kind of patient, long-term, committed finance that you actually need uh, for that uh, you know, innovation along that entire chain. Even Death Valley can take a long time. Um, I'm not going to go through my iPhone example because I always do, and I'm sure at least two or three of you had heard, have heard me go through it. My, the point of the iPhone in my book, uh, which is to say, you know, any, you know, everything that makes the iPhone smart was publicly funded, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, is not to say that you don't need entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs. Of course you do. Of course he and his whole team, including Sir Ives, were absolutely fundamental to making that phone, the phone that most of us carry around today. The concept of design, calligraphy, et cetera, was you know, very important. However, what's wrong is the narrative, the fact that in this 800-page book, you know, not one page, not one paragraph, not one sentence, not one word alludes to any of these public investments which people like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or I would argue Elon Musk today with a Tesla car have absolutely been able to surf that kind of wave of massive um, investments, again, across the entire innovation chain, not just basic research. I want to keep repeating that because it's easy to think where she's just talking about science. Um, so what we, I would say, lack, for example, in some parts of Europe that are today craving for this kind of tech city, silicon roundabout kind of dynamic is not so much the surfers, but that wave. And, you know, the, the, again, the debate around that wave, how to actually achieve that both in terms of the organizations within government, but also how to think about uh, the kind of directionality issues which have, in fact, created it. Um, Anyway, we won't go through that. Uh, when you look at that iPhone graph, you'll see that most of that was coming from the military. The point is this is not just a military industrial complex. What you see is also in areas of health and energy I've already mentioned. This is the investments that the US government ha is making today. Uh, what was it? Uh, in 2012, close to 31 billion just for this sector, but has also been making throughout history, even under Reagan, right? You know, Reagan and Thatcher, yes, they were, if you want, withering away at the welfare state, but it was interesting that in the US, uh, these kind of investments have always been seen, up until now, I would argue, the Tea Party really is in some ways, or the Tea Party debate and its influence it's having is putting all this under threat almost for the first time, but in the past, even the Republican administrations were kind of pushing this through, which again, is not to say that the choices being made were necessarily good or bad, but this kind of active market creating, market shaping role of the US government, which we are instead always sold as some sort of market creating uh, uh, thing, 
um, it, you know, that story is unfortunately not known. And had it been, if you think about these kind of health expenditures, which by the way are responsible for something like 75% of the most important new drugs, the new molecular entities with priority rating. This is research from Marcia Angels, the ex-editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. Imagine how different the debate around Obamacare would have been, right? From you are meddling in our healthcare choices to you are one of the co-creators of the healthcare system. The drugs themselves, at least the most important ones, not the Me Too ones, were actually funded almost directly by government. Um, and this word I just used, directly, is also very important. This is OECD data comparing different countries in terms of the direct versus indirect investments they make in innovation. And what's absolutely striking is that most of the investments in the US are actually just direct. These are not about tax incentives or subsidies or just facilitating business. It's about government saying, we want that to happen, we're gonna make it happen. Which again, is not necessarily good, but it's interesting how different this is from what we're told about the US system. Um, now in green, which again is, is something that many of us are, are hoping to see and some sort of green innovations as being perhaps the next general purpose technologies, you can again see these similar patterns that we saw with biotech, nanotech, internet, which is that that upper right hand quadrant there with high capital intensity, high technological and market risk is almost totally void of private sector funding. Um, and uh, uh, the private sector funding both in terms of actual businesses but also the venture capital type of funding in different areas only comes later after the government has actually invested in the sort of the high risk, high uncertainty space. What's interesting in this particular area of renewable energy investments is also this emergence of a new actor which was not that important for IT or some of those old revolutions, which is the um, public banks, okay? So uh, again, Caetano Penn and I are doing some research on this where we found that using Bloomberg New Energy Finance data, that just four really active banks around the world, state banks, public banks, uh, are spending something like four times as much as the entire worldwide private sector. So VC, private equity, stock market, corporate, corporate um, investments. And that would be the China Development Bank, KFW in Germany, Brazil's BNDS, and the European Investment Bank. And, um, this is the German numbers, which just shows you that yes, they are also counter-cyclical. They are doing what Keynes says that public banks should do, do what the private sector doesn't do. So in a credit crunch, increase lending, while the private banks decrease lending, but also directing it around these uh, climate uh, protection uh, projects for this energy event strategy. The uh, China Development Bank, it's astounding how much money they're throwing at that. If you saw the World Cup, you would have seen Yingli uh, as one of the core sponsors. Uh, Yingli Green received 1.7 billion and has a credit line of 0.53 billion. Uh, Huawei, number one today in telecommunications as a Chinese company, received a massive similar uh, loan. So again, what's interesting here is that when we see these kind of numbers that get called anti-competitive, but the real question for policymakers is of course, if we want firms to be competing through innovation, if you need patient, long-term committed finance to make that happen, and if the financial sector is in fact retreating from providing that kind of patient finance, becoming more and more speculative, well, it, it will have to come from some sort of public uh, institution, and do we even have the right competition theory or competition policies within, say, the European uh, Union to actually take note of that, you know, the need for this kind of patient finance versus just seeing these kind of investments as anti-competitive. In the green space, unfortunately, we are seeing something that is um, not necessarily new, but is a huge problem, which is if we think again at, uh, about IT and what led to IT, of course, it wasn't just state. I'm just kind of trying to rebalance that narrative. There was also big private companies like AT&T with Bell Labs um, making massive investments in Xerox PARC as well. And what we don't have today, I would argue, is the, you know, Exxon is not playing the role of, of, of Xerox PARC or Bell Labs. We are having a reduction, especially in the R of R&D, by the big energy companies. And we don't have that kind of co-investment alongside the state around these big uh, new missions, if you want, uh, that are driving things like the energy event strategy. And this is where I want to sort of focus the last um, six minutes that I have on inequality, and sorry it's taken me a while to get there. 
But I want to argue that, in fact, why we have the kind of patterns that uh, Piketty and others, because Piketty, I think, has just written a wonderful book about it, but there's many people, including people like Jamie Galbraith, who've been talking about this rising inequality for a long time, is, you know, has to come back also to this changing level of commitment to invest in these long-run areas, which, of course, are also the areas that create skills. Right? One of the only really approaches out there in the mainstream today that even talk about the relationship between innovation and inequality is this uh, framework, which I don't want to bore you with, but called kind of skill-biased technological change. That when you have these big changes in general purpose technologies, the IT revolution, you know, nanotech, biotech, and green tech, there's all sorts of people kind of left behind because they don't have the right skills to actually adapt to that change, and hence you need government policies to, you know, on kind of these training programs or uh, human capital formation. The real question is kind of where do skills even come from? So if there's evidence, and I will argue as you'll see now that there's huge evidence suggesting that there's a uh, reduction in commitment, not just for innovation, but for these long run areas, including human capital formation by the business sector, you know, that's where skills come from. Skills are also an endogenous result of investments. And so we have to have a theory of an investment in production also to understand these uh, uh, problems that we see. Um, I'll come back to this later. I just want to bring you to some of the numbers. So this is the pattern, right, that Piketty has showed us that all these people are talking about around the world, uh, where he looks at the rate of return on uh, capital, uh, superseding the rate of return on growth. I'll talk more about the, this latter period. Of course, there was that whole post-war, huge Keynesian investments, uh, stimuli and, and welfare state um, investments that brought inequality down after the pre-non-Keynesian kind of governments. But what he kind of focuses on, of course, is today what we're seeing, which is this rising rate of inequality. And he argues, uh, after writing this wonderful book, in the end he says, and what we need is something like a wealth tax. Um, and then he says, but that's going to be almost uh, completely uh, unrealistic. It's not going to happen, which is, of course, a very sour ending to a great book. And what I want to argue is that, in fact, what has happened in that period is completely related to what I've been talking about. In other words, it has been a narrative, a really lame narrative about who the risk takers are, who the innovators are, that have allowed some of the most dysfunctional policies in history to come about and to be some of the leading policies that have actually increased inequality and have done nothing for innovation or investment, and if anything, have hurt innovation. Um, and specifically, if we look at one of the taxes that he talks about, which is capital gains tax, what's fascinating, it was actually exactly in the period where that curve starts to go up, that capital gains tax in the US fell by 50%. So in five years, between 1976 and 1981, capital gains in the US fell from being 40% to 20%. And who lobbied for it? Why did that happen? Was it just some you know, Texan uh, politician who wanted to make his oil uh, buddies richer? No, it was the National Venture Capital Association that had just formed two uh, years before, I was about to say two hours, two years before, which made it basically their big mission in government to lobby for that reduction, because it obviously increases profits immensely to have your capital gains tax reduced by 50%, through a narrative about they, them being you know, the leading kind of risk-taking entrepreneurial force if you want uh, you know, innovative economy, knowledge economy, which in those years was being talked about a lot, you must reduce our tax. And, you know, you need a, a communist like Warren Buffett to come along and say, hello, wrong. <laughs> you know, investments are not driven by uh, capital gains tax. None of my investments, and he, of course, is one of the most successful investors, have ever even looked at that tax. I invest when I see opportunities. And this is very true in innovation. We see this, by the way, in studies that I used to do uh, around entry and exit in different industries. There's no relationship between firm entry and an industry and current levels of profits. None. Which, by the way, again, another lecture, would kill all of microeconomic theory. What actually drives that entry into different industries is the perception of where these future opportunities are. So really what I've been talking about up until now is the kind of also public taxpayer investments which has created these opportunities in this constant instead talk about the need for different types of tax reductions or tax incentives, which there's very little evidence of additionality around, even R&D tax incentives don't really make R&D happen that wouldn't have happened anyway in countries which aren't also funding massively and directly those opportunities. Um, 
And also, coming back to that first slide that I mentioned at the beginning, the financialization of the real economy, you know, lots of people, including, or I should say especially, Bill Lazonic, who's one of my co-authors, who's just written a, an amazing article in the Harvard Business Review on this problem, which is the increasing financialization of industry as proxied by the amount of money that companies in all sorts of different sectors, but especially pharma and energy, are spending just in boosting their stock prices through these share buybacks. Um, in the UK as well, but mainly in the US, but these are global companies, so the effects are global, um, is a huge problem. What's interesting is not only the fact that it's a huge amount of money, we're talking about three trillion in the last decade, but also that that black line there, which is the line that should worry you, which is buybacks over R&D, is increasing massively. But, and hence, it's, it's, if you want, you know, we don't have infinite budgets in companies or countries, and so when you make a decision like that to spend so much, like the 60 billion share buyback scheme of Apple today, uh, by the way, Steve Jobs, no share buybacks, this is a choice that uh, Tim Cook has made, um, uh, that these are often justified in terms of shareholder value. And coming back to this point that I just made around risk taking and the narrative of who the risk takers are here too, there's a theory out there that uh, is taught in all business schools around shareholder value, and it's very explicit on this, or implicit in the sense that not many people know about it, but if you read the theory, it's explicit. It says that the reason that it's good for shareholders, if you want to uh, reap such a large return when it's there, is because they are not, um, they are the only ones who don't have a guaranteed rate of return. So they are the residual claimants. That's a technical word, right? So once everyone else, workers who have a guaranteed salary or government who you know gets its debt paid back uh, banks also who you know get their debt paid back government which is an, an actor there but it's seen as some sort of actor which has a guaranteed uh, uh, return once once uh, everyone else has been paid if there's anything left over the residual uh, it's correct for the shareholders in that company, So these, and we're talking obviously about the large shareholders, to, uh, if you want, make so much of, of the money. So what's interesting is that it's not enough to critique these kind of share buybacks, which again, people, especially, I would say, Lazana, because his work is so great on this, it's not enough to critique that as hurting these long-run investments in areas like R&D and human capital. It's absolutely essential to ask what is that theory even saying? A guaranteed rate of return? Did the taxpayer that funded the internet have a guaranteed rate of return? Well, of course not, because for every internet, you have 10 Concords, right? Lots of failures. For every Tesla, an investment that the US government recently made, 465 million guaranteed loan went to Tesla, you have about 10 Solyndras, a solar company that got 500 million of guaranteed loan from the Obama administration and went bust, and everyone knows about that, right? So huge failures for any agent that is involved in innovation. Um, also workers who uh, today are uh, going into companies thinking sometimes like they used to, that they have a guaranteed sort of life uh, uh, employment. Of course they don't, so they also are taking massive risks and accepting sometimes lower salaries in the beginning, thinking that it's worth it because they have a long life in that company, because that's no longer true. They are also massive risk takers. So really rethinking who are the collective group of risk takers is absolutely fundamental to dismantling, if we want to, and that's a big if, this kind of shareholder value. Um, now this is all really important because innovation is not a random walk, right? Innovation is actually quite path dependent, it's persistent, it builds on innovation yesterday. And why am I talking so much about innovation? Because it is the lead sort of factor that leads to this kind of long run growth that again, economies are striving for because it is cumulative. Unless we have the right theory of the different actors, workers, taxpayers, different types of firms, different types of public sector institutions producing that wealth, then what we actually have is what I would argue we have had is that some actors coming in quite late, kind of halfway through that process, but because policymakers are not confident enough about the role, again, that public policy has had in actually creating that wealth, managing to actually then reap 
the entire integral under that curve as opposed to just their marginal contribution. And I would argue that would be an example of, say, uh, Kleiner Perkins, when it invested in Genentech, made a huge amount of money in, in the billions, um, which wasn't necessarily justified given how much public funding actually went into producing the kind of wealth, if you want, that was able to be produced in a company like Genentech in the biotech sector, which actually uh, as I showed before with the um, NIH uh, numbers, uh, was fruit of decades and decades and decades of entrepreneurial state spending, meaning in the highest risk, highest uncertainty areas, not just basic research. Um, anyway, so in order to get this smart growth, which is also inclusive growth, I would argue that what we absolutely need to do, and I won't go through all these here, is to really rethink who the risk takers are and also to rethink different types. And I'm not a lawyer, but we need also lawyers to think about the exact contracts to be made, different ways in which we might, uh, if you want, redistribute the rewards according also to who actually took the risks in the first place. Um, now. Uh, this would include, of course, reforming the tax system and asking whether it's right that capital gains tax fell so much given that it was justified with a particular theory of who the risk takers were. But also, I've been arguing that why not have, you know, sort of Bell Labs 2.0, where those companies that are obviously so benefiting from these kind of state investments also pay back into. I actually went to Google to talk about this, and they surprisingly agreed. They also agreed that we do not have a sustainable pot of money within governments to kind of do this again and again, uh, both because of the political situation we are right now, but also the inability of doing what we used to do, which is just print the damn money. Uh, we know, especially in Europe, where we don't have central banks anymore except one big central bank, which isn't acting like a central bank. This is especially hard to do. So I have been asking some provocative questions around, you know, should we also perhaps retain equity in the really downstream investments, like in the Tesla case, in order to cover some of the loss of Solyndra. But my point is not necessarily to say this measure is right, this measure is wrong, but really to open up the debate and to say if the public sector, if the taxpayers have not only fixed markets, but have actually been massive creators and shapers of those markets, should we make sure that we also structure things in such a way so we don't get the kind of Silicon Valley situation where all that money went in, and if you look at what happened to the public school system in Silicon Valley, it's extremely problematic. So the public school system did not benefit from that kind of a revolving fund. Um, uh, I think I've gone over, so I, I will actually stop, but just to say that one of the, you know, again, things that I'm really trying to do is not just to talk about this in terms of economic theory, but also to completely dismantle the narrative, the words, as I already said, the word de-risking does not capture what taxpayer uh, funds have done. They took on massive risks and hence should also be sharing in the rewards and thinking about how to do that sharing is a way to really change the narrative away from innovation policy to the inclusive uh, growth agenda. And that's it. <laughs> think. Okay, I'm going to let Mariana catch her breath really, really quickly. <laughs> Done. Um, uh, um, and I'm going to just kick off with a couple of questions about, really practical questions about, you know, how this might look in uh, political terms or policy terms. Um, well, I'll start off with this depressing one, which is um, you look at that agenda that you've set out, and I just wonder whether the political economy of, of Britain is so poorly, if you're right, the political economy of this country is so poorly equipped to deal with that challenge uh, in terms of long-term think, basic, basic long-term thinking, the kind of attitude, the general attitude towards the role of the state. Um, what, do you, what do you say to that? That, well, that we are particularly mm -hmm. ill-equipped to fulfill anything on that agenda? I think there's different things to say there, but I, I'm very keen on also getting more audience participation, so stop me when I start talking too much, but two things. One is, it's, it's interesting how so much of the debate around sort of growth and long-run growth in this country, Sorry, my phone? My, okay. my phone. It's your phone? Good. Yeah. Uh, is around somehow, you know, fixing the finance gap, right? Talking about finance in terms of the finance gap towards SMEs, say, is again very much coming from this market failure perspective. 
Okay, so it's, it's interesting that even these policies that are kind of seen as progressive policies around, again, you know, directing funding towards these poor, starving SMEs is coming from this kind of static framework. Um, and why is it static? First of all, there's no financing gap. You know, the very, very few companies, and there's very few, there's about four to five percent of them, that want to innovate and want to be spending in these very difficult areas. The evidence from people like Paul Nightingale at Spru, where I work, is that something like 90 to 95 percent of those very few, again, four to five percent of SMEs that are looking for financing actually find it. Okay? What we shouldn't do, however, is completely ignore the other 95%. You know, they might not be very innovative, they might not be uh, very productive, they're not, they're not innovative, they're not productive, they're not even net job creators, but you don't necessarily want to completely ignore them. But this is different from how we talk about it. We pretend that somehow all the growth is going to come from SMEs, which actually, you know, very little evidence points to that. But also seeing the financing gap is kind of, again, seeing government coming in just putting a, um, a bandage here and there, as opposed to saying, what kind of finance do we need? We need patient, long-term, committed finance. And of course, there was that possibility when, you know, with RBS, for example, to turn that into something like the KFW, um, and that didn't happen. And I should also say that it was actually the Labour Party, not the, I was about to say the Republicans, but what do you have here? The Tories. Uh, <laughs> the Labour Party, not the Tories, that actually did something really stupid, um, which is, uh, and I just say it that way because, you know, we all, well, I don't know who's in this room, but anyway. You know, I think yes, there's also lots of stupid things done on the other side. Um, <laughs> In, in 2002 that in the name of bringing Silicon Valley to the UK actually reduced the time that private equity has to be invested from 10 years to two years, making that pot of finance, private equity and VC, which in this country, by the way, is not even distinguished in the tax code, which is also not very bright. You know, yeah. they are in theory different, private equity and VC. Yeah. Um, even more short-termist. So, so this is 2002? 2002. 2002. Now, this Gordon is really Brown. interesting. I bet you there's nobody who's connected with the Labour Party in the audience. You would recognise <laughs> that as one of the mistakes, you know, one of the, in the glorious Tony Blair years, uh, the, one of the mistakes that was made. Because I remember covering business for The Observer at that time that you couldn't stop for New Labour pamphlets on how to copy Silicon Valley. And Peter Mandelson put out a big, thick DTI um, report on, oh, how do we create clusters in Cambridge and do this? And this was probably an output of that report, you know. Yeah. And they got, you, they got it totally wrong? Well... I mean, what you need if you want this kind of Silicon Valley stuff, and again, I should just say the only reason I keep talking about Silicon Valley is because it was completely misdiagnosed what led to it in yeah. countries like the UK, but also all over Europe that are trying to copy that are today then getting the policies wrong. So this is not about the US somehow being more important, but they look at Silicon Valley, try to copy it, and don't see the whole thing. So what they got wrong is, A, they thought it was all VC funded, yeah. right? So you get this constant talk about, oh, what we need in Europe is more high risk finance. And it's like, well, first of all, what, you know, look at VC and what they did in nanotech and biotech. And today, as I was arguing in clean tech, they came in 15 to 20 years after this massive wave was created. And so what we actually need to be thinking about is both how to get that kind of VC money, because it is important, and we should make sure it's not just hard money, but also soft money, which means the kind of networking and mentoring that you know, the venture capitalists in the Silicon Valley uh, provided was obviously important, but also understanding how to create that wave on top of which these surfers surf. So and instead, what we don't have today, I think, is the right kind of ecosystem, yeah. which is a producing that way, but also, because we have the wrong narrative, again, mm -hmm. this, uh, pretending it's all about venture capitalists or entrepreneurs, and what we lack is the right education system, so teach these poor students in high schools entrepreneurship, which, you know, kill yourself, I would say. You know, it's better to learn philosophy in high school than entrepreneurship um, in order to open your mind and to think about the future and to do this kind of mission-driven stuff um, because the narrative is wrong when, if and when the growth arrives, it's then distributed wrong because this distribution occurs in all countries. And so this is where the U.S. also got it wrong. They did the funding right, but then they distributed it wrong because the narrative was wrong. So unless you change the narrative in concrete ways, even if you get that growth, it won't be distributed the right way if you this haven't is really diagnosed it. This, the reason why this is really depressing, because if you combine what you've just said with your cumulative curve, if they had got it right in 2002, we'd be seeing the fruits of that right now. 
Yeah, but then you'd have to make sure that you wouldn't then just siphon it all off to that 1% right. of financial actors who then try to convince government constantly. And I should make this really concrete, by the way. This isn't just about the financial sector, right? And it's not even just about things like these share buybacks, which in the UK, to be honest, is not as important as the US. It's also about things like GlaxoSmithKline in this country single-handedly uh, getting the government to uh, introduce this patent box policy. So if you have an airplane and just one little screw on that airplane is patented, the entire income from that airplane is, is subject to this massive tax reduction. That's going to, according to the IFS, Institute for Fiscal Studies, reduce uh, government uh, revenue by huge amounts in the billions without having any effect on innovation or investment, right? This is huge value extraction being done in the name of value creation. Right? Everyone likes innovation. Everyone thinks patents are great. So anything called the patent box must be good. And it's a huge pharmaceutical company alone. Go back to Keynes's quote about the encroachment of ideas being stronger than any capture. This is an example where the encroachment of ideas around innovation, and because everyone loves innovation, has actually led to this massive capture. Um, and yet we're usually told, and I'm asked this all the time, oh, you're arguing big state, the state gets captured. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, yes, the state often does get captured, but the reality is it gets captured even more, even more in countries which have this very little state agenda, which is just so then subservient to all sorts of different types of very mis misinformed business L interests. Last point, going back to the first question really, it's not really about capture, it's maybe about competence. Do we really, say in this country, have faith in those state institutions, in government, parastatal organisations, whatever, to kind of prosecute an agenda like this competently? Yeah. I don't think we do, you know, it's not the Treasury view. Um, I'll just put that up while I'm talking, because yeah. <laughs> it kind of answers that. So I think the problem in this country, but many countries, um, and in fact, the, the point I mentioned before that Labour did in 2002, unfortunately, it's also been done in many other countries in the name of uh, innovation, um, is that because we don't have this kind of mission-oriented, not only around innovation, mission-oriented sort of notion of the state that all you're really there to do is facilitate this profit-making machine, you uh, not only get into this trouble of having it actually be quite hard to attract, again, a Nobel Prize winning physicist just as an extreme case scenario into government to direct one of these agencies, but also you get this really dysfunctional effect, which is the, the increasing outsourcing of government brains. By the way, in the US government this happened, NSA, that whole security uh, Snowden thing, is absolutely a result of outsourcing government brains to the private sector. And I find it really inspirational to find exceptions to that. In the, and in the UK there are exceptions. When government wanted to create a website, for itself, they said, why the hell do you have to go to Google if you want to get a department white paper, you know, Department of Education white paper? Let's do our own website. What did they do? They outsourced it to Circo, uh, which is, you know, getting many, as you know, uh, government contracts. They produce a crap website, static, very highly priced, uh, you know, crap is a euphemism, um, until someone in the BBC, in the iPlayer team, was like, hmm, that's stupid, why don't we do it? And so they brought over, I think it was one or two people from the iPlayer team alongside others who they brought in to GDS, Government Digital Services, created an award-winning website. U.gov uh, has won a huge international design award at a fraction of the cost that Circo was charging government. And perhaps the most important part of that story is today, if you walk into GDS, it kind of feels like Google, a bunch of nerds and geeks with ponytails and sandals, uh, you know, running around with huge knowledge about IT. And it's kind of cool to work in GDS. That's not, you know, that unfortunately is an exception. Instead, by constantly telling us that in the extreme case, Cameron, when he said that, uh, what did he say, civil servants were the enemies of enterprise, but in a more diluted way, we hear this every day, right? The government is a barrier, it's impediment, we should just kind of downsize it, make it more dynamic, but it, that always means downsize it. Um, then it becomes very hard actually to get these kind of dynamic state agencies which are also investing in their own capacities as opposed to just outsourcing the brain and in the meantime making it a really boring place to go work. Let's get some hands. Just, just really quickly, there's one, there's one fact, a brilliant fact, um, on proportion of bird that is state funded. And I think it's a stark fact. Well, what's that number again? So bird in, well bird is just business, um, business spending on R&D relative to sales. 
And first of all, it's, it's low in the UK, it's below average, it's below EU average. This is a huge problem in the UK and things like the R&D tax credit so far have not managed to increase that. So our businesses in this country are not spending enough on R&D, those that are very concentrated uh, in few sectors, but also a few firms in those sectors. And what those numbers were simply showing was that not only do we have the problem that some countries have low bird, but also that the government spending that is trying to make that happen, to go up, is all indirect, again, through these tax incentives, fiscal, uh, um, yeah, so things like R&D tax credits, that's indirect. Yeah. What we see instead, what we tend to see is a higher correlation between countries that have high bird spending in those countries that have actually had very high public spending actually creating those opportunities, technological and market opportunities, within the business sector wanting to invest because it's not just easier, but they actually see that opportunity. This comes us back to Keynes's uh, sort of animal spirits point. What drives investment, which is one of the parts of GDP, right? You have consumption plus investment plus government spending plus X minus M net exports. That I part is really, really volatile. This was Keynes's big insight. Keynes, you know, people think his big insight was on G, government spending. His big insight was on I. I is always volatile. Well, it's, it's very pro-cyclical, too much in booms, too little in bust, but it's also always volatile. You just plot it, you can get the data, it's public, you can get it from ONS, just plot it, it's like, right? Why? Because what's driving it are not things like taxes or interest rates, but the perceptions of businesses where these future opportunities are. So the big question that policymakers should be asking is how to create those opportunities, also alongside the business sector to make them also spend more, but you're not gonna get there just through cutting tax. Take some Points, questions, please identify yourself. Have we got some mics? Here we do. Okay, well, let's say there are three people just in this second row here. Uh, if that's okay, gentleman here. Hi, my name is Jerry Holtham. Um, the, the current MAD situation is itself a reaction to an earlier situation. And I think that's the bit that you haven't, the only thing you haven't covered. It's never mind Concorde, you know. Concorde was the first supersonic jet li uh, airliner. We had the first jet airliner of any sort, the Comet. And before that, we had the biggest airliner in the world, the Bristol Brabazon. Every one of them stayed supported, every one of them a catastrophic uh, commercial failure. We had the world's first nuclear uh, power station. The British state poured tons of money into nuclear power stations. They backed a wrong technology, the whole thing collapsed, and now we import the things from the French. So, I could go on, by the way, but that's yep. enough. I mean, the point is, you talked about mission. I get the point, but how do we choose the missions? We, the British post-war history was not great in terms of finding the right mission. We had plenty of missions. We were going to, we were going to dominate aeronautics. We were going to dominate nuclear power. Uh, we even invented tilting trains, you know, mm. but nothing to show for it. So uh, the mission has to be has and to the be, maglev as well. The first, yeah. Okay, thank you. Very good point. Um, just, uh, is it the lady here with the striped top? Hi, my name is Irgita. I have a question. What are the key elements that European Union industrial policy misses in order to achieve smart and sustainable growth? Great. And uh, did I? There is a gentleman over there. Yep. Yeah. Hi, it's a, it's a question about how you see your ideas uh, get broader traction. In that, if, if you hear the stuff you talked about today in your book, it all makes sense. People get it. So, Pfizer, just to pick on you, you get that stuff. It makes sense. How does it get broader traction? Because not to pick on you personally, Pfizer, but if I look at the media content, lots of those killer stats we saw there, lots of the and their facts. How many times have we seen or heard those facts in broadcast media in this country relative to stats about migrants or benefit sheets or whatever it is? So, so where you have your ideas, they're really battling against the whole paradigm, which is focus somewhere else. Yeah. How, how, it's a broad question, but how would you see those ideas kind of getting into that broader sphere? Great. Three great questions to start off. History, Europe, and actually making it count. Okay. So... Um, the first one, how to choose the mission. So the first point is just to admit that in the past, 
All the, you know, the reason I put, again, that iPhone picture up there is that those were all picked. The internet was picked, GPS was picked, touchscreen was picked, Siri was picked, <laughs> right? So the point is not should we pick or should we not? The, the question is your question, which is the right question. How the hell do we do that picking, <laughs> right? Um, not just in terms of getting, you know, these great smart people into government, which is actually really important because people do matter and there is this self-fulfilling prophecy, but I've already said that. But I would argue that what we need is, you know, when I, when I mention Carlota Perez, who's just sitting directly in front of you there, or on the side, <laughs> um, if you think of, again, how she talks about green as a mission. If Carlota said, okay, what governments should do is offshore wind, you know, that wouldn't be very smart, because if you get it wrong, and again, you will get lots of things wrong, because most innovation attempts fail, you fail, you fail, and you fail again. The best quote on this is, of course, Michael Jordan, who has that wonderful quote of how many baskets he lost, how many games he lost, and that's why he succeeds, right? So if you don't want to fail, don't even bother, because you will fail. But the real question is how to define that mission broadly enough, but also concrete enough, that within that area, you can actually do lots of experimentation and almost have a portfolio of different types of investments. You can do the shale gas, which again, normatively, I might be against or pro, but the point is this is not necessarily good or bad. Lots of people think shale was bad. Shale was 100% funded by the US government. Fracking shale, which today is making you know, the price of oil uh, at a fraction of its past cost in the US, was picked by the US government. But they also did all sorts of other things. Unfortunately, now again, being stopped because of this complete stalemate in government, but the ARPA-E kind of investments are across the board in different green areas. So this is a point. You want some sort of emission, green, let's just pretend it's green, but within that actually have quite a big portfolio because part of that portfolio will completely fail. But that's not enough also. If you are going to fail, how the hell are you going to justify it to your electorate? Because what did happen in the US is Solyndra. Solyndra failed. $500 million picked up by the taxpayer when the solar uh, uh, battery company failed. Um, now, there's a problem there, right? Because first of all, there's a problem with the narrative which is the taxpayer didn't get it. They didn't know. Most, tax, most people in the US don't know about the Tesla loan. They actually don't know it. I mean, part of this is literally information barriers. But even when they know it, unfortunately, there's you know, a barrier because if you don't have the right lens, you don't even know where to put this information. It just gets put in the wrong shelf if you think of your brain as a shelf with lots of shelves. So, this is why it's also important. You know, on the one hand, yes, you need to choose a mission, have a whole portfolio of investments, but also make sure that, as with any venture capitalist who has a portfolio of investments, you don't just de-risk the downside, you also make something on the upside. Either you do that through taxation, for example, having a communist president like General Eisenhower, right? Do you know what the upper marginal rate was in the US under General Eisenhower, Republican? 90%. Okay, so either you go back to that tax rate, and that's already your upside, or, and this is when I start saying or, you, you know, get, think at least creatively around different other types of mechanisms, like maybe retaining some equity in a Tesla type investment to fund the Cylindra loss, or having income contingent loans. We do it with students. Why don't we do it with business? Right? Or, you know, having a grant to the Google kind of investment where, yes, the algorithm is funded by government and it could say, if everything goes bad, no worries. But if you make X billion, a por portion of your profits will go into this thing we're going to call Bell Labs 2.0 <laughs> uh, to fund the next round. Easier for a big country than a small one. No. Yeah. So Denmark. Denmark is small. Is Denmark small enough for you? Is <laughs> Yeah, is Denmark small? Okay, so Denmark today is number one provider of high-tech services to China's green economy. How much is China spending on green? 1.7 trillion is in their five-year plan around these seven different sectors, which are basically all green. It's like environmentally friendly technologies, new, um, new engines, uh, as well as all these renewable investments. By themselves in Denmark, actually having a portfolio strategy on renewable investments, they have then created this incredible dynamic spillovers precisely through these kind of uh, dynamic increasing returns that you have in innovation that I was talking about to also then create the services which are high tech services around that green economy to provide them to this major player worldwide. When GE investors closed two projects in the UK, 
And they were asked by some journalists, why? Why are you leaving? What's wrong? We have you know, these different things, policies that you know, could make you stay, like these tax incentives. They said, there's no green vision in this country. And the real challenge for economists is, what the hell is vision? We don't have that in our econometric models. There's no variable called vision. And it actually matters. It actually matters because vision creates dynamism, it creates spillovers, it creates you know, these, again, connections between <coughs> your manufacturing and your service sector. Um, anyway, sorry, there's, so there's that's two other that, questions. Yeah. Um, Europe, European industrial policy. Yeah, yeah, so, well, I mean, that's a big question. So you said, what should Europe do to get smart, inclusive, sustainable growth? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, again, I think that the way that it's being positioned is problematic. So it's not about, you know, filling in the finance gaps. It's actually about asking yourself in both business and public sector how to create the right type of finance. And I think we're failing on that in Europe. We're talking a lot about the credit crunch and the need for different, you know, financing instruments for different types of business. But we actually haven't nailed the whole patient long-term committed finance. We have pretty sp uh, lots of speculative finance. We have a myth around these SMEs, which unfortunately still drives lots of uh, policy. Uh, unfortunately, size just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, I would argue, for countries. You have lots of large countries, coming back to your question, that aren't growing. You have lots of large, medium, and large companies that are not growing. You have certain kinds of companies, re regardless of size, that are actually reinvesting their profits back into the real economy that do achieve that kind of long-term growth. And that's something also that Europe is failing on, because we think that corporate governance is just a, a firm level decision, we don't actually take a position on that. And this is really important because markets are, are not like just the boogeyman, right? It's not like you have the market pressure and this is causing short-termism in companies. If you just look at any sector like telecommunications, you have Huawei and Ericsson not doing any of these share buybacks that I was mentioning before. And Cisco in that same sector doing huge amounts. They're the third biggest share buybacker in the world. So there's choices to be made. There's agency. There's consciousness to be had within companies, which actually just talking about the market out there causing you to be short-termist and speculative um, is, is a problem. We need to have a theory of the market, not only in this Polanyi sense that I mentioned in the beginning, but also markets are outcomes of interactions between different agents. Different types of companies, large, small, medium, different types of public sector institutions, and different types of households, which might, yes or no, make investments in their own human capital in, in, in the family. And so what we should be focusing on also in European policy is precisely on those organizations uh, because it's there and the interactions between them in order to achieve the kind of markets that we want, as opposed to, again, coming back to this kind of mythological uh, view of the market. And making the, traction, the argument, the traction, the media, the conversations yeah, you mean, have with politicians. My problem is not so much that they don't listen. I'm almost embarrassed when they say, oh, and we're doing this because Mariana said we should. I'm like, oh, God, but wait, hold on. <laughs> don't say that. So let me just give you an example. Uh, well, across the board, I would say, in this country, both different labor people, uh, policymakers um, and uh, conservative politicians in government today. So Vince Cable and David Willits, well, Vince Cable's not necessarily conservative, but anyway, he's in the current coalition. Uh, David Willits have actually come out and said, yes, we have, you know, for example, David Willits said, I did my eight great technologies because I read Mariana's Entrepreneurial State. The problem is that that's not what I was arguing in the Entrepreneurial State, right? The point was not, oh, yes, you have to pick a technology. As much as I actually think we have to do the picking, the point was, A, you need to build that entire ecosystem. You need to fundamentally change your financial system, which we haven't done, because you need that patient long-term finance. You need to really stick it to your businesses, because you need a deal, not just a new deal, you need a deal. Where did Bell Labs come from? Bell Labs didn't come from AT&T just waking up one day and saying, oh, we should great build a great R&D laboratory. No, it came out of a provocation from government. Government said, you are a huge monopoly. We could go after you tomorrow with antitrust policy. But as long as you reinvest your profits into the real economy, and specifically in innovation, we won't go after you. And that's where Bell Labs came from as a result of that provocation. We don't have that kind of, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, you know, tense, healthy, tense, dialogue between business and government. Now, that, that does fit in with, a, why, with I don't know, some the wider perspective of what Labour say they might do when they intervene with markets on the grounds of inequality. 
I haven't heard Labour say one thing about the patent box. The patent box is the most dysfunctional right. value extraction policy in this country. Right. And the problem is that we need courage to, again, talk to business in a way that is really changing this kind of uh, asymmetric relationship. So it's not just about having an active state. I actually think Labour is moving in the right direction. Chuka Muna is doing you know, interesting things and important things around changing, again, the words, talking about this active state agenda. But unless you're also willing to debunk the myths around just these cute little teddy bear SMEs, or also debunk the myth of, you know, the, of what's happening on IPR and I, uh, intellectual property rights and the patent policy, which is very dysfunctional. We are seeing increasing patents upstream, so we're actually patenting the tools for research that we should take a stance on, but also these patent tax policies, which are just ridding government of revenue, which then they cut where? Oh, of course, the schools and healthcare, et cetera. It's all related, right? If you're going to reduce your tax revenue by three to four billion, which is what that tax policy is going to do, you're going to have to cut it somewhere else. Uh, we need much more courage to actually say that was wrong, that this one company basically got that through. Um, and again, I mean, you know, in, in Italy, I mean, just to kind of broaden this out a bit, it's, it's interesting, Fiat, a company in Italy that makes cars that then went to the US, you know, through the Chrysler deal, in Italy makes no investments in hybrid engines. They go to America and they do. What is it, just the DNA? Is it the entrepreneurship culture? No, they were asked to. They said, you know, okay, you come here, you do this whole Chrysler thing, fine, Obama facilitated it, but you're going to invest in hybrid engines here. And they do. So this is the thing. And, you know, again, it's not just a new deal, but a deal. And it's healthy to have that kind of tension. And it's not about capture or not capture deals as seen a backroom thing. This is about actually having a proper partnership and this is why I always say, stop talking about public-private partnerships. Stop talking about ecosystems and tell me what indicators you have to actually measure concretely whether that ecosystem is predator-prey, parasitic versus mutualistic and symbiotic. It's and what we actually need are those kind of indicators. We're really up against time. Let's just take some quick points. If people have got quick points, then let's just let Mariana hit some quick points idea. There's a, gen there's a gentleman there. Um, okay, well, let's take all these quick. If you can be really quick, then that'd be really cool. Just the gentleman there, ju just here, I think it was. Go on. Uh, one thing that does surprise me is you mentioned um, military research at once. And if you think in terms of Silicon Valley, the entire uh, foundation of Silicon Valley is based on contract military research. Good point. Sorry, I'm just going to have to, because we're, we're, we're way over. Gentleman over there, and can we get the microphone over there to go with the beard? Hello. Um, in regard to ameliorating economic inequality, do you, have you ever heard of... Um, I don't see you. Where are you? Just, just there. By oh, the there you are. Column. Have you ever heard of um, Jacob Hacker's pre-distribution? Um, what do you think about it? And not just that, but how can that be practically implemented when we have this blockade of vested interests that will obviously come up against the government if they ever try to implement such a regime? Just with a bit here. Oh, I'm going to forget. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking, I did a physics degree about 10 years ago at Imperial, and I was just commenting or thinking while you were talking that um, when we were having our how to go and do entrepreneurship within our physics degree. It was all about venture capital and there wasn't really any discussion of any other financing options. It was venture capital obsessed um, to the exclusion of all others, essentially. So just a thought more than a question. But. Thanks very much. Okay, so just on um, uh, the gentleman here about military spending. Yeah, so um, I did say something, but I'll just repeat it, which is, yeah, this is all military, right? Just look at the names. I mean, the CIA, by the way, has the biggest public venture capital fund yeah. almost in the world, right? In Qtel. Yeah. Uh, they were very important in the multi-touch screen. You have uh, DARPA, which is Department of Defense. You have the Army Research Office being you know, important for signal uh, compression. So, you know, Army, military, Navy. This is the military industrial complex. Yes. But what did I say after? <laughs> I said, but not only. What's interesting is precisely how that model, let's just call it the DARPA kind of innovation across the entire chain, also through procurement, so actually creating the demand 
for the innovation, which by the way sort of lacks uh, in, in this country but also across Europe, there's much less procurement policy or as, as strong as there is in the US, so creating the actual demand for then businesses to innovate around, um, was also applied to health and to energy and to other areas. So, and, and, and also, that's not enough as an answer, the point then is also, where are you again? I want to look at you, but I can't. There you are. <laughs> um, is this whole issue that was raised before. Well, who decides the mission, right? You know, it is problematic that it was all military. And I would be very worried today if it was still all military and if we didn't have the ARPA E's and, you know, or these you know, across the world, right? Because this isn't just the US public banks working around innovation in, in green. So what's interesting is more the lessons we can learn from that military expenditure. And so because it was all security and war driven, one of the lessons is let's make sure we talk about green as a war. And you know what? It is. It's a battle. And what's interesting is in order to get the kind of both congressional or, or you know, whatever government we're talking about support, but also the civic uh, uh, support, it's interesting that when you phrase it that way, it's easier to get people kind of motivated. That is partly problematic. But you know what? The climate change is a war. Or as, as um, you know, someone once said, uh, poverty is a war, right? The war on poverty. So it's, it's more a question of just not, not only how we're phrasing it, but also making sure, and Andy Sterling at SPRU, again, where I work, thinks a lot about this, how to make sure we have a real debate, not just on the rate of innovation, but the direction of innovation. And precisely because the state is so important in transforming and creating these markets, not just fixing them, we better make sure it's not making really wrong decisions and having a bigger democratic sort of debate around that is important. Pre-distribution, you know, I don't, I don't want to uh, sort of critique that concept because I think it's actually very useful. It's, it's, it's very useful also just symbolically as, you know, it's not just redistribution, it's pre-distribution. You don't just make a mess and pick it up pick up the pieces afterwards and make sure you don't create the mess in the first place. How would you do that? Institution building. Make sure you've got proper unions, for example, so capital and labor can actually negotiate in the beginning properly so you don't just get labor getting screwed in the end and having the welfare state have to come in to pick up the pieces through benefits, right? That's one of the key sort of examples that you would have. Um, what I think it's lacking, and in this article that I put up before, Bill Azonik and I, uh, actually very explicitly critique is a theory of where the hell does wealth come from in the first place. You know, so what they kind of talk about is the need to negotiate different types of institutions that are important to get the contracts right. But because it's not just about contracts, but making sure you actually also have that kind of wealth creation and value creation in the first place, it's, it's also really important to have a theory of the wealth of nations, you know, to, talking about it in the sense that Adam Smith talked about it. And I think pre-distribution hasn't even tried to do that, uh, partly probably because the guy, you know, James Hacker wasn't an economist. And you don't have to be an economist to talk about wealth creation. However, it was very kind of political, which is very important. I mean, one of the really, I think, interesting critiques of Piketty has come from someone called Jamie Galbraith, who's the son of the, you know, famous older Galbraith, who says Piketty actually needs to really think about the kind of institution building that we need to have in order to reduce inequality. It's not just about a wealth tax, it is about things like whether it's trade unions or all sorts of other institutions he mentions. Um, but again, on top of that, one would have to say, and okay, fine, but what is it you're actually creating? Who are the different actors? What's the process? Is it a random walk or is it cumulative, et cetera, et cetera? You actually have a, have a theory and engagement with the production of that value, not just the contracts to be in place so you get the right capital labor uh, negotiation. Well, I think we could talk all night, um, really. For an unbelievable array of global influences and wisdom and knowledge from Chinese solar panels to fiat cars to tilting trains to Silicon Valley to the depths of Ed Miliband's rhetorical uh, cell for, for, for Britain. I mean, uh, the, the two points that I'd love to know an answer to, just to, just to wrap up on maybe a more positive note. Well, a negative and a positive. This does, the technological drives of inequality don't go away under, under your world. That's still, just to sort of wrap up the title of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the talk today, that's the first thing. But secondly, if you're trying to sell your ideas into uh, the British government, European governments, does the fact that these things are just happening, it's a reality now in China and in other kind of more mixed economy um, uh, uh, nations, 
Does that make it a lot easier? Is there a recognition? It doesn't, you know, we can't not choose to do this. China's doing this, we have to do it. Um, and do you feel you, you, know, you, can, you can win the argument because of what's happening elsewhere in the world? Well, first of all, what's interesting is precisely because I'm I'm looking uh, with, again, this research that we're doing at other places in the world, that unfortunately, unless you have the right framework in place that's widely accepted in your country by policymakers, economists, etc., even when you do things right, so whether it's the KFW in Germany, which I don't want to say right, but even when you kind of play this courageous uh, direct public investment game in big new areas, you get accused. What do you get accused of? Crowding out. Right, so, uh, you, you're, so this is where it's interesting to go back to this Polanyi point, which is, what is the definition of the market? Who defines that boundary of what sort of market versus state and who owns that thing? So as soon as you start saying this is you know, created, right? we are creating these markets, um, and in fact, they are created by this kind of direct intervention that immediately changes the point where the indicator that you should have to measure whether you're doing things right or wrong, because you don't want to just say, oh yeah, let's just spend on anything and who cares if we're doing it right or wrong, should actually be tracking the degree to which you really are creating something new. So this is where, for example, in the UK, it would be really useful when you have these third sector institutions like the Wellcome Trust or CRIC, for example, coming into the life sciences sector, or even, again, the government through the Medical Research Council. Um, why is it, you know, why are we not really pushing those boundaries of that market? Why are we working within the confines of what, say, private pharma has defined as the market? So drugs. We should be investing majorly in areas like lifestyle, which aren't profitable, which private companies aren't doing. Instead, unfortunately, you have, on the one hand, what I'm talking about here, which is, you know, all the major drugs are actually government funded, and isn't that wrong then that the taxpayer pays twice? right, because you're paying for the research and for these really high prices, but the big question should be, why drugs? Why just drugs? Why not diagnostic, surgical treatments, um, you know, and, and lifestyle areas to really transform? And so again, in looking around the world, what I see is, on the one hand, yes, some really interesting examples, but even in those countries, like in Brazil, their public bank is always accused of being too active, right? Yeah. And what's interesting there, when you look at the discourse, it's about a really explicit, actually, definition of whose market it is, that you shouldn't be entering this space, or if you do create it, then get the hell out as soon as it's created, because it's not yours. And so this, again, this changing the way we talk about market creation, market shaping, also would make it more easy for those countries that are actually doing it to also continue doing it, instead of having what we have, for example, in Europe, where the EIB, the European Investment Bank, was
basic research would kind of justify the really upstream uh, investments around basic research, what you actually have had in places like Silicon Valley, and you have today in places like China, parts of China, are in fact investments along that entire chain. So you probably can't see this, I don't know if you have smaller uh, uh, graphs near you there, but the, in the orange are different types of public sector institutions which were critical to that process from the National Science Foundation, DARPA. So the, the National Science Foundation, which founded, by the way, Google's algorithm, DARPA, which was one of the lead funders of the internet, the SBIR program, which in the UK we've sort of copied, not very creatively, using the same letters, SBRI, uh, which pr provides basically early stage seed financing for uh, companies. ARPA-E in the Department of Energy, which is trying to do for renewable energy what DARPA did for the internet in terms of really funding a lot of applied downstream research. And if you read the websites of these agencies, again, public sector agencies like the BBC, um, again, I'm, I'm repeating the BBC for a purpose, which again, hopefully we can come back to later. Um, are very mission driven. If you read you know, ARPA-E's website, it's definitely the mission to think about in a creative way, different ways to uh, catalyze innovation around renewable energy investments. Um, by the way, if you think of it in the German case, those green investments that they're making, I think, is also very explicitly mission-oriented because they have this mission around the energy vend strategy, which is completely trying to transform and greenify green um, all sectors, not just kind of wind, solar, and biofuels. And Carlota Perez, who's in the audience, has been one of the leading people around the world, I think, really giving us a way to think about that because green is not really a revolution if you think about it, right? Lots of these technologies have been around for a while. IT was a revolution and it has absolutely not been fully deployed throughout the whole economy yet and green could become a new direction uh, through which the IT revolution does become fully deployed. Um, in the same way she argues that for example suburbanization was absolutely important and all the policies around it to allow mass production, that revolution, to really diffuse and get fully deployed. So so green as a redirection of IT, as suburbanization was kind of a redirection of, again, mass production. I should, I should again repeat, none of this means good or bad. I obviously am someone who, or shouldn't say obviously, I am someone who thinks green and thinking about green is absolutely fundamental, but that example I just gave of suburbanization, you might have people saying, well, that was a, you know, the wrong choice, or uh, going to the moon, well, how silly was that? We should have used all our money for something else. So the point is not to say good, bad, it's to say that actually these state investments have huge transformative market making, market creating potential and hence the immense need that there should be or that there is to actually make sure that we talk about this directionality as opposed to thinking that all you need is kind of these background based the kind of boring things that the state does and then the market will decide the direction. Markets are actually quite blind and what we see in these transformative periods in history is that the direction itself uh, was actually, uh, if you want, almost imposed in a, in a, a decentralized way, because these are you know, different types of public sector institutions uh, by government. And so we shouldn't be so worried about should we pick or not pick winners, we should have a much more open and dynamic debate of you know, how to do that picking, how to make sure that, for example, we are actually able to attract into government uh, top thinkers and experts like, for example, the man, a Chinese American man who was recently running the Department of Energy in the US, Steve Chu, who was a Nobel Prize winner in physics. And you know, how cool is that? The problem, I would argue, that by having this really narrow, boring, lame way to talk about the role of the state at best, at best, because we all know that lots of people say just get the hell out of the way, we don't need state investments, at best as market fixing becomes this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're a top graduate from any um, university, do you just want to be a fixer, a tweaker, doing little things here and there, or would you find it much more interesting to go work in a place like Google, uh, where you're actually told that you are you know, the, the person who's kind of shaking and making the world? And this is what's, I think, absolutely central, not just saying we need more money or we need all these great institutions. We absolutely have to make sure that we are attracting into these institutions people of top expertise who can actually uh, think big.
Um, let me just run through some of the data quickly. I mean, this is quite important, I think, this SBIR funding that I mentioned, because again, if you just think of it as, as basic research, it kind of just becomes something that everyone knows is important. What's interesting is precisely because the financial sector, coming back to that graph I showed before, has become so short-termist and speculative, the need for this kind of public funding of the actual companies that want to be innovating, so early stage seed finance to companies, has become increasingly important to come from different types of public funds. Why? If you talk to any venture capitalist, you know they're obsessed with an exit, which they want to happen in three to five maximum years, mainly through an IPO or a buyout, and that's not necessarily the kind of patient, long-term, committed finance that you actually need uh, for that uh, you know, innovation along that en entire chain. Even Death Valley can take a long time. Um, I'm not going to go through my iPhone example because I always do, and I'm sure at least two or three of you had heard, have heard me go through it. My, the point of the iPhone in my book, uh, which is to say, you know, any, you know, everything that makes the iPhone smart was publicly funded, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, is not to say that you don't need entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs. Of course you do. Of course he and his whole team, including Sir Ives, were absolutely fundamental to making that phone, the phone that most of us carry around today. The concept of design, calligraphy, et cetera, was you know, very important. However, what's wrong is the narrative, the fact that in this 800-page book, you know, not one page, not one paragraph, not one sentence, not one word alludes to any of these public investments, which people like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, or I would argue Elon Musk today with a Tesla car, have absolutely been able to surf that kind of wave of massive um, investments, again, across the entire innovation chain, not just based... Note this culture war in British, in British politics uh, from the 80s, this culture war where, you know, it's either you're all in on the role of the, on the, role of the state or you kind of think the free market has to pursue uh, uh, wealth and uh, wealth creation for the whole uh, of the country, and that's the best idea. This cultural war between the kind of Adam Smith Institute and unions, clearly the world works in a much more mixed economy, and uh, Mariana's book and lectures and TED Talks speak to that and communicate that slightly complicated issue in the most fantastic way. So without further ado, I mean, you, you know, she's a professor of economics, uh, of the economics of innovation at SPRU, the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. Um, and without further ado, please welcome Mariana Mazzucato for her prize winning speech. so much. Uh, this is a real honor, especially given that it's the first year of this prize. Um, it's going to happen every two years, is that right? Or every year. Um, and it's also an honor because the other shortlisted um, economists were absolutely fantastic. Not only Piketty, people started calling this the the prize to beat Piketty. Um, and I will actually be talking about Piketty because I will be talking about inequality, but also I must say that, again, it was a real honor to be shortlisted amongst these other uh, greats, uh, including Hajun Chang, who um, I work with uh, indirectly quite closely in terms of uh, how close our ideas are. Um, so what I actually want to do before I, well, first to turn on my timer here, is to focus on the need, are my slides, oh, here we go, on the need to actually talk about in, um, inequality and all the issues around it, and especially the critiques that many people have made recently after the financial crisis in terms of uh, you know, parasitic capital versus productive capital, too much value extraction, not enough value creation, to actually posit that critique, which is so widespread today amongst policymakers and different types of economists, within an actual theory of production. Okay, because otherwise I think it remains sort of uh, icing on the cake and what I'm seeing today, and I think lots of us see, is things are actually getting worse. You know, some of the hedge funds uh, have made huge amounts of money from, for example, the Greek debt uh, crisis and our inability, I think, to actually really reform the financial system, but also the production system, the distribution system, has been, I think, linked to the fact that we have not linked these critiques to an understanding of how actually markets work. Um, so we can't just talk about markets going wrong without first talking about how markets work within a broader theory than what I'll be talking about in terms of the market failure paradigm within neoclassical economics. But also, again, we cannot just make critiques around value extraction and all these things that have gone wrong without really positioning it within a theory of value creation. 
Um, and so, first of all, the context, right? We are in the UK um, where uh, this is Andy Haldane's graph here, which just shows how much financial intermediation as a percentage of gross value added has completely outpaced the real economy, right? So this is the context within which, again, policymakers, the media, um, civic society talks about the absolute need to rebalance away from kind of the speculative finance towards the real economy. And in fact, industrial policy, which is something that I've been talking about along with my colleagues for years, is actually no longer a four-letter word. We can talk about it, and it's seen to be the way to partly, if you want, nurture, again, this growth of the real economy. So first, I just want to say something which I will get back to towards the end of the talk, but it's so important that I think one should say it in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end so we don't forget. This way of positioning the need to talk about production and the real economy and industrial policy and innovation is problematic. Why? Because really one of the big problems has not just been finance versus industry. Um, and the need for you know, higher quality jobs and long run investments, but the degree to which the real economy, industry, has become incredibly financialized. Okay, so I, I'm gonna be bringing that up throughout the talk, but this is very important because I think, given that I am a, a, a professor of the economics of innovation, one of the weaknesses, I think, today of innovation policy is in fact that it's not linked up with an understanding of, say, the kind of changes with, we need around corporate governance, uh, so how businesses actually behave, whether it's better for them to be organized in terms of shareholder versus stakeholder type of capitalism, if you want, but also the absolute need to be thinking not just that firms require finance, but what kind of finance they require, and also what kind of, if you want, guidelines should be uh, helping firms to really make these kind of long-run investments rather than just boosting their short-term uh, stock prices. But this battle around rebalancing away from finance towards industry, this you know, need for innovation policy and industrial policy, which is finally, again, back on the agenda, is just one of the big battles. I think one of the really interesting things around the world, definitely if you just read what's you know, written on top of the sort of big uh, outdoor, uh, build, sorry, the sign out, outside of the OECD, but also within the European Commission, within the UN, but also many different nations are talking about the need, not just for any kind of growth, right, because lots of countries are starving right now for growth, but growth that is, again, innovation-led, I sort of already alluded to that, so smart innovation-led growth, but also growth that is more inclusive, so less, not more inequality. We have been experiencing rapid increases in inequality, and also growth that's more sustainable, which doesn't only mean green, but green is a good sort of a, a one-word summary of what that means. And what I've been sort of talking about really in my work, which I really want to position as not just about innovation, is the complete change that we need in, in, in terms of actually thinking about the role of policy in the state in the process of economic growth. And in fact, the biggest battle is precisely that. Okay, what exactly does the state do? Or, and by the way, I should say this because this is the first critique many people make and I'm sure it would be the first question. I am not talking, when I talk about the state, kind of big brother, ministry, top down, right? I'm gonna Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a special event, the inaugural lecture associated with a new prize, the New Statesman Sperry Prize for Political Economy. Uh, my name is Tony Payne, and I'm a professor of political economy at the University of Sheffield and one of the directors of Sperry, uh, which stands for the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute. And it's my very pleasurable task to begin the evening and to say a few words about this new prize before handing over to Faisal Islam who will introduce the prize winner to you. The prize we're awarding tonight is a prize for political economy. So I want to be very clear what we mean by political economy. And the simple answer to that question is that we're referring to the very close interaction of economic and political processes in society, 
that was instinctively and automatically the focus of attention of a whole range of distinguished founding social scientists as diverse in their approaches and methods as Adam Smith, Karl Marx, Max Weber. In a nutshell, it, what, it was what was universally thought to be important to study before economics and politics broke away from political economy to become specialist and some would say increasingly narrow disciplines in their own right. So the very concept of political economy inevitably contains within it something of a critique of some modern economics and some modern political science. And yet oddly, it's political economy that's still rather on the defensive, such as being the disciplinary power of these two subjects, economics I think rather more than political science, that being or saying you're a political economist today, despite the long history I've mentioned and, and, and amidst the existence of a crisis, being a political economist sometimes feels like riding up the down escalator. And it was very much that sense that political economy needed to be celebrated rather more that led Sperry, the, the institute in Sheffield that I uh, jointly direct, to think up the idea of establishing a new prize in the field for political economy. I suppose we might have called it not the Nobel Prize in economics, uh, but we didn't. Instead, I'm delighted to say that we developed a very close and warm uh, collaboration with the New Statesman magazine, itself more than 100 years old, to create the New Statesman Sperry Prize for Political Economy. And I'm deeply grateful to Helen Lewis, the deputy editor of the New Statesman, uh, for all of her initial enthusiasm and subsequent active support in this collaboration. We decided that the prize would be awarded biennially to, and I'm going to quote this next bit, the scholar who had succeeded most effectively in disseminating original and critical ideas in political economy to a wider public audience in the preceding two or three years. That was our formal statement. It emphasized originality and critical capacity, of course, but also, and for us, just as importantly, the ability to disseminate and spread the word of what was being argued beyond the academy. We assembled a jury, two people from Sperry, two from the New Statesman, uh, supported by uh, Ms. Zara Connor, economics correspondent of the Financial Times as a kind of representative of the media, uh, and Dr. Gavin Kelly, chief executive of the Resolution Foundation as a kind of representative of the think tank world. We gathered and deliberated and published a short list of six names, all of whom we thought were very distinguished political economists, and all of whom could actually have been deserved prize winners. In fact, we didn't realize quite what a difficult job we had given ourselves to do in choosing one of the six, which perhaps makes it all the more remarkable that we were, in the end, unanimous as a jury in choosing the prize winner that we did. So it's a special evening for that person, and I'm now going to turn to Faisal Islam, who's uh, transmuted from being economics editor of Channel 4 News to political editor of Sky News to introduce this evening's prize winner. Faisal. Thanks for that. Yeah, that, that job change, I hope, makes, it, uh, makes me lucky enough to be able to have a modern contemporary perspective on political economy, having covered economics uh, for 10 years and now uh, dabbling in the dark arts of politics, not personally, commentating on it. Um, in my previous job as economics editor, I was, I have to just paint this picture, uh, this amazing picture, a, a key multilateral kind of research event with um, uh, research and development ministers from all around the world and uh, journalists and academics and in the centre, Mariana and people just trying to tap into her brain and her ideas. And the really impressive thing about the pamphlet, which I'm sure you all know about, and which was then turned into a book, The Entrepreneurial State, is just how practical it is and how few public policy practitioners bothered to think or check these things beforehand before Mariana came up uh, with her, her, 
uh, thesis on uh, the role of the state and the changing role of the state in a modern economy. Coming from economics into politics, I kind of... ...to be talking throughout the talk about a decentralized kind of network of different types of public sector institutions that have been absolutely important for generating a certain type of growth, and again, also today, needing to think about those institutions, how to shape them. But I would include there, in the UK, just to be clear, agencies like the BBC, okay? So I'm actually talking about publicly funded agencies, institutions, and departments, okay? And so what I'm saying here is that actually within economics, one of the real battles that we have, or the battle that I face as an economist thinking about the role, if you want, of public policy, is that we actually don't have words to really talk about the role of the state. Um, I've just put here these two quotes by Keynes. The first one is really important because what he says that the role of government, of policy, the state, of the public sector should really be big, right? Big thinking. We're not talking about just tinkering on the edges, doing things a little bit better or a little bit worse, but really doing what's not being done at all. So in fact, one of the ways you can think about this blind spot that I'm talking about is that the way that economists talk about what's not being done at all is really limited. And what I'm trying to do is sort of broaden that out. He also says something really important for, again, maybe another critique that might come, especially from some of my interdisciplinary colleagues at SPRU, is, you know, well, why are you just talking about the problems of economists, right? I mean, just let them go and talk about the real world. Well, no, the problem is, Unfortunately, as Keynes tells us here, so many people who think they're just being guided by sort of practical thinking and they're not wed to some sort of economic theory, unfortunately, are often the slaves of some sort of defunct economic theory or theorists. And in fact, what I'm going to be focusing on, since we can't talk about the entire economy and all of economists, is specifically this defunct uh, way. And in fact, I should go back to that quote because it has something great at the end where he says, I'm sure that the power of vested interests is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. In other words, this constant talk about government somehow being captured by business is nothing compared to how much government and policymakers are captured by this kind of you know, encroachment of ideas of these defunct economists. And I'm gonna be focusing again specifically on the way that economists think about the role of the state in the process of economic growth. And just to put it kind of quickly, because we don't have that much time, uh, there's you know, the sort of two broad ways that people talk about this is either the need just to fix the public good problem, right? So specifically within, say, the area of innovation, you might have, say, you know, basic research. It's a public good because it's so hard for firms to appropriate returns from uh, basic research privately because of the huge spillovers. And hence, you know, more or less everyone agrees that that's an obvious case for, uh, you know, government intervention. Of course, other types of pu uh, public goods like infrastructure, education, uh, water, clean air, uh, those would all be examples of, you know, the need for public intervention. And this is not to say that that's not important. There's also a, all sorts of other areas that would uh, be justified through this market failure framework. What I'm going to be sort of arguing is that is that that's quite limited, actually. What governments have done in those few places in the world where uh, 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 countries or regions within countries have achieved this kind of smart innovation-led growth, that only kind of describes 20% or so of what's happened. Of course, the other kind of more general framework and way that we talk about the role of the state, again, thinking of places like the European Commission, uh, which I, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm often at to advise uh, policymakers um, is in terms of these framework conditions, right? The need for different types of public policy to create these kind of background conditions, um, framework conditions for then the private sector to do uh, its thing. Now, my main critique is really kind of building on the work of Carl Polanyi, who's, who some others have also, I think, found great inspiration. And Carl Polanyi was not an economist. This is quite important to say. He was a historian slash kind of sociologist. And his big point was really to understand the way that markets and the distinction between markets and the state is actually false from the start. I mean, I'm today gonna to be talking a lot about the innovation economy, because we talk a lot about that in modern capitalism, but he really positioned this from the start, from the beginning of capitalism, which, by the way, is quite recent. It, it hasn't been around for thousands and thousands of years, right? This is the big debate also between Marx and Engels. Uh, how old was capitalism? Um, so from the beginning of capitalism, about 300 years ago, the market actually emerged almost via, actually via state intervention. Um, and it was quite interesting because he compared it to local 
and international markets. He argued that local markets, kind of like fruit stands where you, you know, buy fruit or vegetable in the corner, uh, which we still have today, or international markets, were actually, you know, actually are quite old. And they almost seem natural in the sense that they are so old that you could almost say they're in the DNA of uh, the human race to you know, go and sell and barter, perhaps in a corner, corner. He didn't actually say that, but the point is these local and international markets are very old, whereas the national market, which is the specifically capitalist market, was deeply shaped and created by constant state intervention. We would not have had, we wouldn't have today the kind of markets that we talk about had it not been for different types of political and legal changes. Um, he says it here, um, administrators had to be constantly constantly on the watch to ensure the free working of the system, the so-called free market. It was in no way natural. It had to be imposed through all sorts of different uh, 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 um, legal and political uh, changes. So different, you know, the, well, obviously prop, you know, uh, private property, uh, the notion of public goods, the different uh, um, regulations, which of course are behind the enclosure laws, child labor legislation, infrastructure, R&D funding, introduction of different types of tariffs. This is the kind of thing that, for example, Ha Jun Chang has written about so eloquently, one of the other people shortlisted for this prize. What I try to do in this book, and sorry, this is the quite self-promoting slide. There, there won't be another one, but again, this is probably the, the night to do it. Um, uh, is, is to really think about that insight that Polanyi had about the falsity, the absolute falsity historically of state versus market in the modern context of the sort of innovation, knowledge, information society. Because nowhere more than today, in fact, was that initial insight he had just so true. And what's interesting is that even though different people, especially in my area in innovation uh, economics, have critiqued sometimes this market failure framework for justifying certain things, we haven't actually built um, within, I, I would argue within economic or heterodox economic theory, a real alternative to that market failure framework. So even when we come up with these great progressive policies, they often also get evaluated through different types of indicators which actually derive from that framework. So what I try to do in this book, and I just have to say that the German title is obviously the best one, you know, Das Kapital, this, that, and it was quite nice that Piketty and I uh, were up against each other also for a German prize, and it was his, you know, Das Kapital in the 21st century, and my Das Kapital, this, that, and it kind of looked like everyone was writing Das Kapital for a minute there, which unfortunately isn't true. Uh, and I should also say that the German publisher, I don't know if they would want me to say this so explicitly, but on the phone when we were talking about what the German translation should be, she said, you know, Mariana, the problem is that for most of the German left, the word entrepreneurial state in German is kind of going to make them vomit. I was like, oh, that, that's great, thanks. And so then she said, you know, she had this great idea for the book uh, title. I was like, yes, well, why not? In Italy, it was quite interesting, the title, The Innovative State, because in Italian, and I'm not sure if other Italians would agree with me, but the word imprenditore or imprenditoriale doesn't do, for me at least, what entrepreneurial does, because what entrepreneurial means to me is obviously not just setting up a company um, or running a business, it's really the willingness and the ability to really think and envision the, the spaces that have the highest risk and uncertainty. So to sort of op be operating in that upper right hand quadrant and just think of it in different sectors or different even regions of the world depending on what the state of development is. Um, those areas that are subject to the highest capital intensity and the highest technological and market risk. Um, and specifically, what I tried to do was completely debunk this idea, coming back to those uh, you know, ways to think about the role of the state, that somehow all the state was doing um, in the in innovation economy and the information economy was just creating these kind of background conditions and doing you know, the necessary paperwork, getting the right tax and legal system, getting the right also infrastructure, research, and good schools, but then letting the really interesting dynamic stuff be done in the private sector. Because this kind of lame approach, which then specifically leads us to use words like de-risking, right? The role of the public sector is somehow just de-risking the private sector, ignores the fact that in fact in so many different examples, at least the ones that I talk about in the book, but also that, um, for example, Caetano Penna and I, who, who's here, he's a research fellow working with me, we're looking at around the world, like in China, Denmark, Germany, or Brazil today, really seeing this kind of entrepreneurial role of 
different types of state institutions which have been willing to really think about different missions, different visions, actually creating actively different markets, not just fixing different problems within them. Because that view really brings you again, and, I'll, and hopefully we'll, maybe we'll come to some of this in the question and answer period, to a completely different view of the role of public policy. We do not need government to simply sort of assume the existence of Keynesian animal spirits wanting to invest and perhaps being guided, yes, wrongly by herd effects or bandwagon effects. You know, Keynes is very important insights that what's actually driving investment behavior is actually kind of this gut instincts of where those future opportunities are, but actually creating those opportunities, right? So we don't have a lion in a cage business wanting to invest, and again, perhaps also doing it wrongly because of these bandwagon effects, um, and then needing uh, the state to enter to sort of just take away different types of impediments, which unfortunately today in innovation policy is one of the big sort of mantras of how we think about it. So R&D tax credits, or in this country, the patent box, or just kind of facilitating the process, but actually the need to create that instinct, that animal instinct to want to uh, invest, to actually create those opportunities, which only then business follows. Um, some water. Uh, when I talk about innovation and technology, I'm not talking about sort of gadgets and changes from the iPhone 4 to the iPhone 5, but these really kind of big technological changes that have occurred, which have created kind of decades of growth. And in thinking about them, I thought that was already the sign saying five minutes, but it's just his iPad, thank God. Uh, <laughs> um, really thinking about the way that uh, market failure policies, which again, completely guide how economics thinks about the role of the state, can basically not explain at all the emergence of any of these really relevant technologies, which again, created decades of, of growth. And the big question, of course, today is what's gonna be the next big uh, general purpose technology? And of course, what kind of sort of visions and missions might drive uh, the public sector to actually make those kind of investments? So let me just, Go back to this. I wish this was going to be closer to me. Anyway, um, I'll keep drinking. Mm. What do I mean by mission driven investments? I mean that in thinking about those different uh, general purpose technologies, what you had was two things. First, that they were again driven by some sort of mission, you know, not necessarily good or bad. This is not a normative point, right? This is just kind of a fact. So getting a man or a woman on the moon was one of those missions. Fighting climate change today is another one guiding lots of investments, for example, in China, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and what's interesting is both the, the, the fact that that kind of vision was created, the fact that it required lots of different sectors to interact, right, kind of 13 to 14 different sectors had to actually been, you know, be catalyzed if you want to get a man on the moon. This was not a sort of standard industrial policy in saying, oh, we just need aerospace and, and some sort of other manufacturing sector. Lots of different industries, including textiles, made that happen. Um, but also that these investments were in fact along the entire innovation chain. So that this again, classic justification for the role of the state in areas like public goods, like 